Hey, everybody, we're going to be talking about genetic analysis today. It's an important topic on the MCAT. And so when you think about genetics, you probably think about chromosomes. And so this slide here shows you the cell cycle of mitosis. And basically what happens at in G1, what you do is you go into S phase. So you're grown in G1, you go into S phase if growth conditions are proper. Here's two sister chromatids attached by a common centromere as a consequence of DNA replication. And then you enter the G2 phase, you make sure that everything happened in S phase properly because when you go into M phase, you don't wanna segregate uh, badly replicated, incompletely replicated chromosomes to daughter cells. And so in M phase, what you see here is that we actually generate a spindle and we use anaphase to separate the chromatids, chromosomes from each other. And then what happens, you have two daughter chromosomes where you are born in the G0 phase. So meiosis occurs in our germ cells, sperm and testes. And here what you see is diploid chromosome here. So I didn't show you all 22 X and Y uh, in humans. For simplicity, we see two homologous chromosomes. Now homologous chromosomes, they are not identical, but rather what they are is they're homologous. They're similar, but not identical. So we replicate. And what we do is we get four uh, N. And what happens is that you can cross over in prophase one of meiosis. And what this is, is genetic exchange between sisters. It's actually done by homologous recombination. And after meiosis one, you get two daughter cells. And what you can see is that there's been exchanged by the red and the black. And so what we've had is further diversification of the genetic material. And meiosis two generates four progeny that are all haploid, but they're not identical, but rather they're homologous to each other and so these are basically your siblings. Now we'll see a passage with spores and yeast, but this of course occurs in humans. If you don't do meiosis properly, what can often, often happen is non-disjunction. Now non-disjunctional events are due to like failure to properly separate chromosomes. And as a consequence, some cells at the end may have more chromosomes than other. Now, whenever you don't have the proper number of chromosomes, you're said to be aneuploid because we're normally euploid. So here's oogenesis, and the oogonium here is diploid. It replicates to make a primary oocyte. And so what we see, as we saw before, are two sister chromatids held together by a common centromere. And then in meiosis one, what you do is you get an asymmetric division occurring such that there's a, a secondary oocyte takes the lion's share of the cytoplasm this secondary oocyte is haploid, has two chromatids times 23 equals 46 total chromatids. There's also a small primary polar body, which has the other chromosome, but also it has very little cytoplasm and it's not gonna be viable in, at all. The secondary oocyte goes to meiosis two you also generate another polar body, a secondary polar body, and you end up with one haploid cell at the very end. So crossing over, as I said, occurs in prophase. Here's the crossing over between three hypothetical genes, ZYA. And what you see in this double crossover as represented by the chiasma, what you see here is that there's a genetic exchange between the red and black such that the big Z is crossing over right here. So you go over and down, pick up the little Y, come back up and get the big A and get Z little Y A. And what you can see in red and black are the actual recombination events occur. You can see where the genetic exchange has happened. And so here's single crossovers down here as well. What you should appreciate is that double crossovers are far more rare than single crossovers. So Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk. He examined inheritance traits in peas. He discovered that traits were present in pairs of hereditary material. He named them alleles and he came up with two laws. The law of segregation of alleles is that alleles are individually transmitted from parent to offspring in a random manner. So for example, the height of a pea can be controlled by one allele as well, and the color of the seeds can be controlled by another allele, but their transmission from parent to offspring are occurring in a random manner. He said also that these uh, alleles of one trait separate independently from alleles of a second trait. So basically 
what you have then is the exception known as linkage. That is, if the alleles are so closely linked, if they're on the same chromosome, then his law won't be valid. So he never really reported this observation. And so any plants that he saw that didn't obey his laws, he might have thrown that data away, which raises some interesting questions. So you can predict crosses with Mendelian laws. So for example, one of the things Mendel looked at was P color. There's, uh, they're either yellow or green. Now I've shown you yellow and red because yellow doesn't look too good on a screen. So what you can do is take the parental gametes, okay? And so what he did was he crossed a yellow, big Y, big Y, okay? And, and a green, little Y, little Y. And what you do is you generate a Punnett square which basically shows you the probabilities of what to expect with the offspring. So when you cross two big Ys and two little Ys, you get a heterozygote here, big Y, little Y. And then this is the F1 generation because all the progeny will be heterozygotes. He crossed the heterozygotes with himself and made it the F1 cross. And what you get from the F1 cross when you cross the two heterozygotes is you get one big Y, big Y, two big Y, little Y, and two little Ys. This is the classic three to one phenotype. That means three out of four plants are expected to be yellow because they are dominant to green. And then the genotype is one, two to one. So when you have three that are yellow, you can't initially predict which, are the, which one's gonna be yellow because it's Y, Y, or which one become, become yellow because big Y, little Y because Y is dominant to little Y. So sex chromosomes have the same type of phenomenon occurring with probability. You can take XX from female, here's the gametes from meiosis. You can take XY from the sperm from the male. And when you cross them, what you do is you can see that the probability of being a male or a female is one to one. And so a test cross is used to determine an unknown phenotype. I just mentioned with P color that you couldn't tell big Y, big Y from big Y, little Y. The heterozygote was indistinguishable phenotypically from the homozygous recessive. So what people do is something known as a test cross. So in this example, I've used plant height, big A or heterozygote A, little A. And so test cross is always used homozygous recessive. So in the case where big A is tall and little a is short, if you were to cross to a homozygous recessive, that any recessive trait in the unknown is revealed. So for example, you take uh, homozygous dominant versus homozygous recessive. What you do is all the plants are tall because all the progeny are heterozygotes. But if you took big A, little a, the heterozygote and crossed it with little a, little a, homozygous recessive, then what you would get is a one-to-one -one tall to short. And so what you can tell then is with a test cross, you can determine the genotype of an unknown. So there's an important uh, idea known as complementation. And so what we see here is that we have two cells and we're gonna mate, these could be spores that we mate. And then what you have is a little a and a big B, a big A and a little b. So what happens is that since big A and big B are dominant traits, you need to have a cell that has one big A and one little and one big B. And by complementing, by putting them together, you can do that. But any individual cell by itself doesn't have that. So if you look over here, what you do is when you cross these two, little A, big B, little a, big B, what you do is you get Bs are okay, but you are still homozygous recessive for the trait conferred by A. And so that would not complement. Now we see complementation occurring in bacterial systems as well. And this is the notion of bacterial partial diploids. So a male bacterial cell or an F plus is a cell that contains a chromosome and what's something known as the F plasmid. This is a giant episome. And in this case, what we see is the chromosomes missing X, the gene for X, it's mutated in X, doesn't make the product X, but it has the X plus gene on the F plasmid. If we were to recombine these, okay, and these F plasmids are well known to recombine the chromosome, what you would generate is a cell known as an HFR cell. 
high frequency recombination. And now what you see is that this cell has been reconstituted for the X allele. It's partially diploid. And you can actually get this mating to occur by taking uh, an F plus male that has the, the F plasmid and it can grow a pillow. So it's, it's basically bacterial sex. It introduces the plasmid into the F minus cell. And then what happens is that the female cell becomes a male cell and you replicate the actual F plasmid and then you can have conference of the trait. So you can actually move these plasmids around and change the diploid nature of bacterial cells. Actually, they're, they're truly, they're not diploid, they're haploid. You can make diploid cells by doing this. We also see this occurring with viruses and specialized transduction. And I think we saw a little bit of this before we talked about viruses. So in this case, you have a phage injecting its X plus DNA into a host bacterium that is X minus. And what you generate then is a cell that's X minus X plus because the phage brought in the X plus. Now, when the phage actually propagates and leaves, it might actually cut out part of the chromosome. It'll bring the X plus and deliver it to a new bacterium that might actually be X plus on this chromosome. And now what you've done is you've made a diploid bacterium. It's called a marrow diploid, who's specialized transduction. So Mendel's laws are great. There's exceptions with linkage, as we saw. You should definitely understand how to do Punnett squares and how to get typical one, two to one genotypic ratios, as well as three to one phenotypic ratios. You should be aware of more complex dihybrid crosses. We have a lot of that stuff on our website. But there's other things beyond dominance and recessiveness. So let's take a look. Here's the LDL receptor. Uh, LDL is involved in cholesterol metabolism. And so here's somebody who's wild type. Here's somebody who's heterozygous. Here's someone who's minus, minus, homozygous recessive. And what you see then is you can measure their cholesterol. And what you find is that in the normal situation, it's 120, but the heterozygote has 400, despite the fact there's a good copy of the receptor. So the minus minus is 700. This is pretty dangerously high cholesterol levels. The fact that the heterozygous doesn't have the same phenotype as the plus plus homozygous uh, alleles is known as haploinsufficiency. So just because you're plus minus doesn't mean you're always gonna look like the plus plus. There's also incomplete dominance. This is known as blended. The classical example is where you have red and white flowers. And then what you do is you get a pink heterozygote state, okay? There's also co-dominance. The classic co-dominance is the ABO blood type system. There's over 20 blood type systems that are available. The most common are ABO and rhesus. And so what happens is that you can express on the surface of red blood cells the B antigen, the A antigen, or no antigen. And it turns out that no antigen I is recessive to A and B, but each is expressed regardless of the status of the other allele. So it's not really dominance and recessiveness, but rather it's co-dominance. There's even more complex inheritance patterns that we should all go over. There's the idea of penetrance. This is the probability that somebody with a genotype will express the corresponding phenotype. The classic example is somebody who has BRCA1 deficiency. So the question is, what is the probability that that person will get breast cancer? And it's about 70%. So not everybody who's deficient in BRCA1 is going to get breast cancer. It's because they have other genes, other genetic backgrounds, other environmental conditions that they experience. And so the idea of penetrance is the probability. There's also the issue of pleiotropy. This is where one alteration in a gene induces many aspects of a phenotype. So for example, if you're missing the ATM gene, you can be sensitive to ionizing radiation. You could be cancer prone. You can have difficulty walking. You can have telangiectasias. These are problems with your uh, blood vessels 
notor notor notoriously in your eye. So that means one gene gives you many different phenotypes. Polygenism is the idea that traits are influenced by numerous genes. So you think like Mendel, Mendel's peas are rather simple, right? If it was yellow it was, or green, it was wrinkled or smooth, tall or short. But you know, things like intelligence, for example, are influenced by numerous genes. So there's really no Mendelian cross for something like that. And in fact, we probably find more complex behavioral traits are, more, are subject to polygenism. There's epistasis. We're gonna see epistasis today in a really good yeast secretion pathway where Randy Sheckman used yeast genetics to actually win the Nobel Prize. It's a brilliant set of experiments. This is where interactions between genes where the expression of one is dependent upon the other. And a really good example that I find quite simple is baldness versus brown hair. So if you don't have the gene to make hair, that is your, you have a bald gene, you're never gonna have brown hair because you can't make hair without the baldness gene. So what happens is that the expression of your brown hair is dependent on whether or not you can make the hair itself. So hair color and making hair are controlled by different alloci. So another favorite topic on the MCAT is pedigrees. This is understanding inheritance patterns where we use pedigrees or we look at generations, family generations and their, uh, their traits. So autosomal dominant is sex independent. So males get it with equal probability as females and we designate it as such. So it looks like it's basically like a heterozygote. This is trait A and this is the dominant allele. This is a mutation in a gene that's considered to be dominant transmission genetically. There's no such thing in autosomal dominance of having the homozygous recessive here. It's always believed to be lethal. And so autosomal recessive, it's sex independent, skips generations. Mitochondrial disorders, they are rare. Uh, this is where the affected mother passes on the traits to all males and all females. X-linked dominant, is shown here, this is XXD, what you can see is that 50% of the progeny will be affected, whether it's a male or female. X-linked recessive skips generation, mostly affects males, but when you consider X chromosome inactivation, females can definitely get it too. Y-linked is males only, and you can get it from inherited from an affected father. Remember, XY versus XX. So let's take a look. What type of inheritance would this be? Think about that for a second. What do you see? So we see a female is affected, the male is not. So she passes it down to her child. And basically what you get is an affected child who uh, has a, an offspring with 2A and then all the children are affected. What is that? That's mitochondrial inheritance. Everybody gets it from their mother, regardless of their sex. And so the idea of mitochondria is that they don't segregate their DNA like under Mendelian laws at all. So it's definitely non-Mendelian. So what happens is that mitochondria replicate, okay? And when the cells divide, they don't necessarily divide out the mitochondria evenly at all. And in fact, what you see is that in this case, we have way more on the right one. So the right cell inherited more mitochondria from its mother in the left one. And this, this lack of equal dis distribution is called heteroplasmy. And what you can imagine is that the, the, the phenotype may be more severe in this one than in this one. So although all these kids are affected, the severity of their disease might not be the same. What type of inheritance is this? This is autosomal recessive. What you can see here, this is a fairly easy one to figure out. These are two heterozygotes, the two carriers had, a, had an offspring and they're what you saw. So we know that basically the uh, males are squares and the females are circles is the convention. What type of inheritance is this? So we see a mother in 1D has, is affected and one of two of her offspring are actually affected. And then you see 3D half were affected. This is autosomal dominant. You can actually draw out a Punnett square to figure this out over here. So you should be able to look at all of these 
pedigrees and figure out the traits. There's rules of probability. So you should know the rule of multiplication of the probability of two events happening is the product of each individual event occurring separately. In the rule of addition, the probability of either of two events happening is the sum of both of them, PA plus PB minus PA times PB. So think of the probability of winning the lottery and getting hit by lightning, but having both of those happen, you multiply, having one or the other happen, you use the rule of addition. And so what you can do is also do a pedigree problem where you have the following. So a pedigree was constructed to understand the nature of transmission of a newly identified genetic disease. What is the probability that 3A is born with the disease? Look at 3A over here. So you see a diamond. The diamond basically means you don't know the sex yet. So this is a pregnant mother. So the probability that 3A will be born with the disease. So you have to figure out the mode of inheritance on this first. Do we use the rule of uh, addition or subtraction or multiplication or whatever? What are you gonna do? So what you see then is that only the males are affected. And so what you notice then, this is a Y-linked disease. And so the probability of getting a disease is the probability of being a male, which is 0.5. So definitely familiarize yourself with all these pedigree problems. Uh, population genetics looks at genetics in the population as a, as a name implies. And so we're looking at the gene pool, the sum of all genes in a population, the most common thing people use is the Hardy-Weinberg equation. And what this does, it makes some assumptions and it reminds me of the universal gas law, which made these assumptions, like, oh, molecules don't interact with each other, they don't touch each other. We know they do, but for simplicity, we say there's no net migration, no mutation, no natural selection. Random maiden occurs and the population is large. Imagine this is like on an island would be the most realistic version of this. The total number of alleles is P plus Q equals one. If you square each side, you get P squared, two PQ, Q squared equals one, where P and Q are the frequency of dominant recessive alleles respectively. And so what you're gonna be given is the, some trait that's passed through a population and you're gonna know the fraction of people that are heterozygous, for example, and they may ask you, uh, something about P or something about Q. So it's kind of a plug and chug type of question. So what we'll see today is the genetics of yeast secretory pathway. So you have to know your genetics, your dominance, your recessiveness, your all the stuff. You need to know that, but you have to apply it to various scenarios. What we'll do is we'll take yeast and they exist in haploid or diploid states, but we're gonna look at temperature sensitive mutants which define permissive and non-permissive states. So for example, at the permissive state, like at room temperature, the cell may be producing that gene and it's normal, but if you raise the temperature, then that gene becomes mutant. And the reason why is probably because of the folding of the protein as a function of temperature. If you raise the temperature, maybe some hydrogen bonding that normally occurs can't occur anymore. And as a consequence, you're in a non-permissive state. So temperature sensitive mutants are a big deal. And so let's do some passages right now, okay?